Nina, delight to meet with you and uh, uh, converse and hear a bit more about um, what was the background to all the exciting things you've been doing recently. So um, you say that you were, um, you were brought up in, in London and in Spain. That sounds pretty exciting. Is that because your parents were, you know, one Spanish and one British or? Uh, no, my parents are actually, um, I'm half Russian, half French. So totally <laughs> different. <laughs> um, but my mum fell in love with Spain and um, we just kept going there. And eventually she thought maybe we can just stay here. So we did. Uh, but every so often we'd have to come back to London either the practical aspects of schooling or her work. <laughs> um, right. Eventually she'd get homesick for the sun and off we'd go again. So your name would normally be spelled Mira, uh, Mira is that right? Yes. <laughs> Nobody has ever, um, you know, pronounced that so well, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> and how do people tend to say it then here? Oh, I get all sorts, including things like miracles, um, murals. Murales, they'll say, yeah. I expect. It's, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, my name, my surname, used always to be uh, misspelled platter, people would put, or plat, or various other sort of uh, un, um, unattractive uh, mutations. So, uh, you, were you born in London? I was born in London, yes, yeah. in Greenwich. And you, so when you say you lived in London and in Spain, does that mean that you were in London for the school term and then in Spain for holidays or? No, I did in fact study in Spain periodically. So um, yeah, it was quite, quite messy in a sense because I would do, uh, you know, I was born in London and I was here probably up until the age of six. Then I did a year in Spain came back, did two years here, then we did five years in Spain. And I went to a number of different schools in London and in Spain. Um, so there was just a lot of constant back and forth. <laughs> Gosh, and where, where did you live in Greenwich, in the old village? Um, no, I never lived in the old village. When I, the majority of the time when I was growing up, I lived uh, on the way to Blackheath, if you, no I know what you mean, yes. Yeah, because uh, I went, in fact, to Blackheath School for a while, and my dad lives just next to that, so it was just very handy. Um, yes, a good friend of mine was up until about a year or so ago when he retired, the vicar of uh, um, the church in Greenwich, the old Hawksmoor Church, you know. The one that's in the middle of the heath? Yeah, no, in the middle of, well, in the middle of the town, in the middle of on the edge of the heath, yes, right on yes. the edge of, yeah, yes. yeah, it's a very, very fine church by, um, it's very Nicholas scenic, to yeah, Nicholas Hawksmoor building, it's a great building, yeah, um, and was uh, dedicated to the, uh, uh, name of the man who was, uh, what do I mean, well, pummeled to death, to death with mutton bones, you know, I think the 11th century by the Danes, when they were being particularly unpleasant. Gosh. So there you go. Oh. Yeah. He'd been Archbishop of Canterbury, I think, as well. Yeah. So, um, so where were you at school in London? Various places. Yeah, quite a lot of different places. Um, I guess I was, when I was small, the longest I was anywhere was probably in Blackheath um, prep school. And then later on, when I was about 13, 14, I went to a boarding school in Kent, um, near Chislehurst. Um, oh, right. What was that called? That was called Farrington's in Stratford House. Oh. In fact, I'm not even sure if it still exists. Um, it was never a really big school. Um, and I, I find, it, bizarrely, a lot of schools disappear, more than you yeah. think they would. <laughs> but yes. Well, I think I think private schooling now is quite a, a competitive industry, as it were, you know, it so. Uh, and quite increasingly controversial. <laughs> I suppose, although I, I think it'll always be there because, you know, it, it seems to be one of the sort of rights that people have. If they, if they can summon together the necessary capital 
and they think that education is important, they'll do it, I think. But you're right, I think we've lost some schools because they've merged with others. Anyway, so then at the end of that, um, so how is it that your parents were in London then? Were they working here? Uh, they were working here, yes. So my mother was an interpreter. She came, um, I think it must have been in the 80s, maybe in the early 80s. So when, you know, Russia was still the Soviet Union um, and it was incredibly difficult to get out. Um, so I think she had quite a journey with that, um, leaving Russia. But she spoke English um, and she'd worked with American tourists, strangely, in St. Petersburg. <laughs> so she came here, she worked for the BBC um, on their Russian service and then well, other things as well. Um, she worked with some uh, film, um, politics and oil. So basically everything that you can do with languages. <laughs> um, and my dad, yeah, I think they, they met when she was in France studying because she then wanted to learn more languages and he came back to the UK with her. And what did he, what was his speciality? Was he an interpreter too? He was not, no. My, he was in computer programming. Uh -huh. So do you speak Russian, French, Spanish and English? I do. <laughs> all four? Yeah, that's my <laughs> legacy from the frenetic pace of it all. <laughs> and is there... Which one would you say you're least proficient in? French. French. Hands down. <laughs> right. Yeah. Although French and Spanish, to some extent, will help each other because they're both Latin languages, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. So my husband is Portuguese and I find that as soon as I got used to his accent, uh, I would. it was really quite easy to sort of decipher what he was saying um, because it's so similar. It's, yeah. It's not so much the words, it's literally just, you know, the intonation, the accent that throws you off. And as soon as you've kind of cottoned yeah. on. <laughs> but I remember Russian, I did start to learn Russian in the lunch hour at school. But I'm afraid the need for food overcame my uh, capacity to learn Russian too. And Russians, the Slavic languages are a different group entirely. Mm. That presents certain challenges, doesn't it? So I have a friend whose wife is Russian and he always says life is too short to learn the language. <laughs> and I think he actually has a point. Um, yeah, it's, it's incredibly complex. Um, I, I speak very fluently, but if I don't practice, for example, writing, I find that, you know, my spelling drops away so quickly. Um, and it is, uh, I think it's a whole different kettle of fish. It's hard to get your head around. Yeah, and I mean, they don't have, I think, is it, they have aspects of verbs, don't they, rather than, is that rather than tenses? Like, like, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, they do have tenses, but they have, so the alphabet is a lot bigger. It is, yes. Um, and they, you know, they have that in Latin based languages where there's kind of female and male and um, you can have kind of su prefixes and suffixes that mean, you know, like small or big or something like that. But in Russia, they take that to a whole other level. So maybe in Spanish where you can say something as small by adding <laughs> um, something on the end of the words. In Russia, you can have like really small, extra small, slightly small. <laughs> so it's just that the vocabulary I think is also possibly wider. Um, I don't want to offend yeah. any English dictionary lovers. <laughs> well, I, I did, I learned the alphabet because if you're in Moscow or somewhere, it's pretty crucial to be able to understand that. Otherwise you wouldn't have much idea what, what buildings are and what they're saying and so on. Um, Great. Well, uh, and then you went, when you left school or schools, <laughs> where did you go then? Um, I came, so I finished my A-levels in Spain um, in an English school there, international school. And then, then I came back here to study at UCL and I did what I know best, which is languages, right. primarily, in fact, Russian. Where did you live in Spain? Lived in the south on the coast, so in a small, 
a really small town called Almanyaca in between Granada and Malaga. Right. Yeah, I can work out where that is. And where in Russia did your mum come from? My mum is from St. Petersburg. Ah, oh, right. Which... Well, that's, a, that's a fine city, isn't it? I, I hope they're doing it up, are they? Well, it got a lot of love and care some years ago. Um, I haven't been, obviously, the last few years because of um, coronavirus and then other difficulties, uh, because they're always changing the rules between the UK and Russia. Um, yeah. But I think it's probably the most beautiful city. Um, I, I love it. And I think it's really vibrant as well. It's so cultural. But the funny thing about it is, in a way, is that it, it's a European city rather than a Russian city, isn't it? I think it's, you've got the nail on the head, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. So, yes, yeah, so you went to do languages at uh, UCL and you did Russian, but alongside that you did art history? I did. So I actually started because I was really interested. I've always been interested in writing and film and possibly film writing. So I initially enrolled to study Russian and film, um, which was a, a module they were offering alongside. I, I'm not sure if they do those kind of combinations now, but um, then I realized very quickly that I was hating the film. So I switched to history of art um, pretty much on a whim. I didn't actually really know what the subject was. I think I was harrowingly naive <laughs> when I went to university. I didn't even know what half the subjects were, but I really fell in love with it. And then you went to King's to do um, a master's. What was that in? So that was a business master's because I felt that I'd kind of immersed myself so much in, in culture, writing about culture, um, art, history, that that I, I was kind of lacking slightly on the more practical aspects. And I did my master's much later. So I actually only finished it last year. Um, so by then I had already been working and I had my own company. So within, within that, as I suppose, I, you know, the company was getting bigger and so on, um, I felt it might be really useful to have kind of academic, um, structured <laughs> business, learning um although well i don't know there are plus sides and downsides to it so that was a businessy sort of degree really, was it the masters yes yeah 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 and then yes i see right and did you did you go from there to now i don't know how to say it did you say londoner what did you call the magazine i just call it londoner yes <laughs> yeah. did you go straight to that so I started Londoner, um, I had kind of a wobbly start after my undergraduate uh, because I wasn't sure what to do. I knew I wanted to write. Um, I didn't know how to get into writing. I wasn't sure what I wanted to write. Um, I took a standard graduate job in law actually um, because I assumed that, you know, I had to have an income and a direction, but uh, I hated it and had a number of other jobs that didn't last very long. And in the end, I started Londoner because I thought this would be kind of a project to practice my own writing, to meet other writers, see how the industry works a little bit in terms of writing reviews and PR and stuff. So it was never intended to become uh, more than it you know, initially was, which was just a little side project project for experience but we got a lot more attention than um i think i was expecting <laughs> so then i just ran with it really tell us a bit about london what was the focus and is it still going london is still going and in fact we just got a grant last week um which i'm really excited about because it means we're going to be able to do a huge amount of more things um which is really nice because i took a break last year during the pandemic um, to kind of figure out what we would do next. But Londoner is arts, culture, history in London. Um, my goal when I set it up was to give, you know, writers some experience and some exposure, people like me who didn't know how to get it anywhere else. Um, I basically couldn't figure out, you know, in my early twenties and without any contacts or anything like that I couldn't figure out how people got started in journalism 
um, or what they would need to know. So it was kind of my, my way of figuring that out. And what it became is, so it's, I think of it as like a platform for timeless writing. So, you know, you don't have to be, know exactly what happens in the news to read an article in London. It's sort of, I wanted to foster this feeling of slow journalism, of thoughtfulness, and also to offer something that other people aren't talking about. We're a really small platform. Um, I can't compete with people like, you know, newspapers like The Guardian or even um, monthly magazines and so on. I have to offer something uh, that nobody else is talking about. I didn't want to write a review of the, I don't know, most... Um, sought after restaurant opening that month because everybody would be talking about that restaurant or talk about what happens in Wimbledon because everybody will be talking about that. So instead, a lot of what we do is, um, yeah, unearthing unusual stories, forgotten histories, things like that. So um, the example I always use is we have an article on why milkshakes are a really popular murder weapon. <laughs> Um, we have a lot of things about London, so forgotten figures from London, um, quirks of the city, um, from things like how Prince Charles influences policy on architecture, to um, the stories of, of forgotten artists um, and their legacy in the city. So really eclectic. Uh, but always something that you probably wouldn't hear about otherwise. And how frequently is it published? So online, we generally publish two pieces a week because, again, I don't want to overwhelm an audience. I think this 24 news cycle, uh, I guess it can be exciting. I think it can also be too much Sure. You can keep up with something if there's only two articles a week, but I also want them to be the best articles you will read that week. So the best writing, no errors in grammar, <laughs> something that takes a long time to research. So generally speaking, it's not something that a journalist can knock out in a few hours. Sometimes people research this stuff for weeks or months. Um, so it has a much slower pace. I did do a print edition, which I will be picking up again. Um, and, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that out more than twice a year. Um, and we do events as well. And so events has always been my main revenue stream. And the events- well, I, must, I must look out for the next print edition when, it, when it's coming anyway. <laughs> and that, now move us on to the, your book. Um, I know that some people have had a chance to have uh, heard a bit about that on one of the literary evenings with Peter and Mike James, but um, I'm sure there'll be lots of people who didn't hear that. So would you like to say a bit about the book and uh, Absolutely. What, what made you choose that subject and so on? So it was kind of, I just have a, a curiosity <clears throat> for digging up um, stories that you know, um, nobody else has that are unheard of, a little bit of the beaten track. And I sort of got onto this just thinking about Anna Winter. I think I was working on another fashion piece and I thought, who were the early Vogue editors? And if we haven't heard of them, is it because they're terribly dull? Um, so I just started looking back and seeing who they were and what they'd done. And it turned out that everyone that I looked at was the most sensational character. There was the first ever editor of Vogue who was there like nearly 60 years. She invented the catwalk, um, you know, has a huge legacy, but nobody's ever heard of her. And they're all like that. Every single one of them is completely complete really and colorful personality of their own. Um, and I felt there was this huge kind of, um, potential for these people you know and they were so influential not not just in their time but even today um things that they did still impact the fashion industry and I thought I can't believe nobody knows about this and there are no books about written about them um so that just seemed like a, a good find to have stumbled upon and that 
that could really be something to explore like a, a big project. So that's how I kind of got into it, um, more out of personal interest and, and the love of it. And the, and the stories are wild, you know, of models getting stuck in caves in Peru overnight, <laughs> um, or of editors spending 7 million on a photo shoot on a whim, and then never running the pictures. And, um, it's amazing that the links they have as well, that um, very few people know that British Vogue uh, was working with the Ministry of Information during World War II. Um, so that's, they kind of reached into every facet of society and I thought it would be great to piece together the history of Vogue. And um, who is it? Well, I haven't, yet, I haven't yet got my copy. I know I ought to have done, but who is it published by? Quercus. Right. Well, I'll look out for it. It's it is under her shirt. Yeah, I'll look out for it soon. Uh, do you know, have you, have you, have you met one of our distinguished um, um, liverymen, who was also um, a court assistant for quite a time, Kit Van Tulliken? No, I haven't. Well, you ought to meet Kit, because she, she's a Canadian uh, by birth, and she and her husband came over here back in the 1970s, I think. Um, and her first job was with Queen magazine. I've just realised who this is because I watched your interview with her. <laughs> ah, right. Yes. Well, there you are. She'd be a very interesting person for you to meet. Yeah, I would love that, actually. That was, a. I mean, all these conversations are great because this so many exciting people at the station is but yeah absolutely that would be wonderful yeah because she was uh, first of all queen magazine and then of course went on to time life so um you know really sort of top grade um uh, magazines how is your book doing yeah well there was a really early reprint um which was really exciting because the shops weren't even open yet um and they they reprinted it i think a few weeks or one month after it first came out so that was really exciting and there was a lot of great reviews in um the times and the irish times and the independent so i was quite surprised because you never know on the one hand you think vogue's a big story that should get a lot of press on the other hand you sort of you're never sure I think books are so tricky to market and um, sometimes you never know what people would be interested in yes now I think I saw the uh, review in the time in the um, times weekend review um, and it was a really positive review um, and tomorrow we're going to go and do a little walk up into the west end we're staying here at station at Hall at the moment because of all these events and I'll go and look into Daunt Books you know Daunt Books I love Daunt Books yeah best bookshop yeah. in London aren't they yeah <laughs> great yeah spectacular so what's the next project well I've been thinking about this long and hard and I don't really know um of course yeah uh I have some ideas for potential um books in the future non-fiction as well um but it takes a really long time to develop that kind of project and you have to produce a really detailed brief so there's a lot of research to be done if I want to um do another one of those I did I mean I guess my childhood dream really is to write novels so I hope that one day I'll be able to come back to that and it will fit in somehow <laughs> and how can perhaps my last my last parting uh, uh, question is what do you think stationers ought to be doing for people who are young stationers and you know what what sort of things can we do in, in, to encourage more young stationers I think the station is the the most amazing thing they have is the stationers themselves um, and I've said from the beginning the more access if we could if young people had to you know um, the older guard really that itself would be so exciting because I, I watch a lot of the the talks you do these ones the interviews yeah. and I've been blown away by even maybe something where I thought well I don't know much about stationery or that's obviously not my area uh, there's 
I mean, the people who are at Stationers are incredible. It's so interesting. Everybody's story is so interesting and they will naturally have so much experience that I think would be invaluable. I mean, the fact that people talk a lot about a digital world um, and new media, I think there's that doesn't at all take away from, from everything that, you know, from the experience that people will have amassed in slightly different um, situations. So working for print media, I think is still really valuable to hear about, even if you work in new media. Um, so I think connecting young stationers to older stationers is, is incredibly valuable. Even just hearing the older stationers talk is, is incredible. I mean, you would never meet people like the stationers anywhere but stationers. Really interesting. And I think one of the things that's made me think about is that uh, I've really enjoyed doing this. I think you are my final interview, I think. Oh. <laughs> and I think we've done either 50 or 51 interviews altogether. And I think one of the things that you've made me think about is how can we continue something, not every week like this, but relatively regularly, even if it's only once a month or once a two months, because it's a very good way, as you said, of introducing old to young, uh, one subject to another subject, one industry to another. Anyway, uh, Nina, we better stop, otherwise I should be in trouble for allowing it to go on too long, because one of the problems is you're all so interested to talk to. So thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs>